When you sign up to be an EPP, extra podcast person to Real Ghost Stories Online, you'll have access to the best ghost stories we've ever told. The oven door started slamming open and closed. And in places like this, oven doors take up entire walls. Never before had I seen such clear evidence of something non-human being in a room with me. Because it felt like somebody was here. You know, you see, I did it written in paint where you just painted. These are stories only EPP members have access to. I don't know why, but I just wonder if that scream isn't a family member that was there to claim their loved one. There was like something standing there right in the threshold of the doorway. And I was paralyzed. I couldn't breathe. It's only $5 a month when you sign up at realghoststoriesonline.com by clicking become an EPP. There was an old lady standing at the foot of the bed and she said she could see details and everything. You know, it just looked like an old lady standing at the foot of the bed. You'll get access to the best ghost stories and exclusive video content we've ever created. I have no doubt in my mind that it was completely supernatural. But it felt like it was in my head. Like it didn't feel like I was hearing it. It felt like it was in my head. Become an EPP now and help keep our show on the air at realghoststoriesonline.com. Click Become an EPP. Welcome to Real Ghost Stories Online. Call in your real ghost story now at 855-853-4802 or write in at realghoststoriesonline.com. You are about to enter the world of the unknown and quite possibly... The Undead. This is Real Ghost Stories Online. That indeed it is. And on today's episode of Real Ghost Stories Online, what would you do if something paranormal took over while you were driving your car? I suppose probably the same reaction I'd have is like uh, when a, a child throws an apple at you or... Oh, uh, no, did she do Any that? other random object from the back seat at you. Kind of probably like that. Did she do that this morning? A little bit. Oh, no. I saw her leave <laughs> with an apple. Did you make her mad? She, she used it, it. She used it as a weapon. She used it as a weapon. Was it just because she thought it was funny, or was she pissed? Uh, I think it was just randomness. Okay. And there was really no point to it. We were just talking, and all of a sudden, I noticed an apple fl- flying by me. Like, yeah. Okay. Well, I don't think she likes those apples, by the way. Well, they're the nasty apples. What do you mean they're the nasty apples? They're not like the sweeter apples that everybody likes better. Wait, what type are they? Um, I'm not good at my apple choosing okay. from the store. I just get apples because I, I think I do not app- like Red Delicious at all. They are not delicious. <laughs> and there you go. So I like either, was it Gala or Pink Lady or something like that? Now we that know. They're a little bit sweeter. Now and, we know. and the girls don't like them either. There you go. They throw them at you. So that's how I would react if it goes through something at me in the car. Also, a woman finds that she is not always in control over her lucid dreams. The scent of a neighbor lingers after he is long gone. And a listener shares of her stay in a hotel that did not try to hide the fact that it is haunted. Those stories, your calls, and more today on Real Ghost Stories Online. That is very much false advertising when they're called Red Delicious. Well, it's like what compared to what? Compared to the sour green ones? <laughs> the little tiny ones on our apple trees because yeah. they don't grow very big. I don't yeah. know. As opposed to crab apples. Mm-hmm. They're uh, they're red and delicious compared to that. I don't I uh, I just I'm bad at uh, I'm a bad apple picker, I think. Maybe it's just marketing. See, they're delicious. <laughs> Buy them. Maybe because nobody liked them, they had to just put that on there. Uh-huh. There you go. It's like demon away. Mm-hmm. Used to just be called like uh glade plugin. Now demon away gets demons out of your house Mm -hmm. so there you go uh 855-853-4802 is our phone number here at real ghost stories online to share your real ghost stories with us we would love to hear them so feel free to uh let us know what's going on in your world of paranormal of course you can also write it on the website at uh, realghoststoriesonline.com or you can even email uh, your story if it's an audio file that you're recording on your smartphone rather than calling it in you can resend that uh, that's a file, that audio file to Jenny, J-E-N-N-Y, at realghoststoriesonline.com. Berna is our first uh, letter writer of the day. Hello, Tony and Jenny. As ever, thank you for this podcast. I, fortunately, am only scared of stories about possessions. That's one of my more freaky ones, too, I think. <laughs> I've always been freaked out by that whole concept. Luckily, there's a new television show this fall I saw 
and to take off of the Exorcist, mm-hmm. coming to uh, I think Fox. I think I could be. Wrong. I think that's what you said. Yeah, but uh, could be interesting. Could be horrible. Who knows? Uh, I mostly feel a sense of peace when I listen to the story shared by the other listeners. I also have to say that through the sharing of these experiences, I have come to understand the different levels of paranormal experiences there are. I'm always particularly disturbed by those experiences where somehow sound is cut off. Never had any doubts about the existence of what we call paranormal, but I have not had many experiences to share. I do, however, have three quick stories. Years ago, I was living in Portugal. I was seven months pregnant with my first child. I and my then-husband were driving home from a visit with the in-laws. It was around 10.30 p.m., and we were driving along a very busy stretch of uh, ring road outside the city. Suddenly, a car overtakes us at a huge speed, zigzagging from lane to lane. It surprised us, but it didn't scare us. A few minutes later, we're exiting this ring road on the way home, and the car suddenly fills with a scent of flowers. I remember looking around trying to find the source of the powerful scent, but there were no flowers. It was February. It was nighttime and the car windows were closed. Stayed in the car for a while. We arrived home about 10 minutes later. My husband suddenly asked me, could you smell the flowers? I was surprised. Thought I'd imagined it. He said he could feel both my brother, who died when I was three, and his best friend, who drowned when he was 16. Somehow, I can only think that maybe it had something to do with that car that was zigzagging at speeds from lane to lane. This day, I cannot explain it, but I assume they made their presence noted for some reason. Fast forward a few years, and we're living in Ireland. He was coaching soccer, and on his way home one evening, he took a side road as a shortcut. As he was driving, all he had surrounding him were empty fields. He told me when he got home that from his right, he suddenly sees a woman running, screaming in silence and a man running after her with what looks like a knife in his hand. The apparitions went right through the car and disappeared. Years later, I was told that this specific area has a very bloody and tragic history. A few years later, I'm married to my second husband and we're living in Australia. We went out for a walk in the warmer and the warmth of summer and we're walking and chatting and suddenly for a fraction of a second, I saw a young man dressed in jeans and a blue t-shirt. He saw me and disappeared. He had such a look of sadness. Right behind where I saw him, there's a major motorway, and there are many fatal accidents there, so I can't help but think that maybe the young man lost his life there. This is the only time in my life I have actually seen an apparition. I can sense presences, but I never see them. Again, thank you for the podcast, and keep it up. I'll become an EPP as soon as our bank balance reaches a healthy level. Thank you to both of you and all the listeners who share their stories. P.S., the stories about your three-year-old and her macabre sense of humor. I think it would be terrible to be a ghost and be still plagued by the thing that was trying to kill you in life. You have to keep doing it over and over and over? Yeah, you're just running from this guy with a knife for the rest of eternity. That's where you have to wonder, is that, you know, is that really a conscious thing that's going on, or is that just some sort of energy that's replaying itself like a like a broken record. I hope it's just, you know, residual for the sake of the ghosts mm-hmm. involved because that's just terrible. I I agree. The first part with the uh, the car that was swerving, you have to assume that they somehow intervened and kept that car from hitting them. Mm-hmm. And that was their way of letting them know, hey, look at, uh, we're okay. Yeah. You know, I could see that being the case there. Thank you for uh, sharing all of those stories. We really do appreciate that. That's our phone number. Callie says, A couple episodes ago, a listener told their lucid dream experience. Really enjoyed listening to you discuss her story as well as your experiences with lucid dreaming. I've always spontaneously lucid dreamed. And I've gotten, as I've gotten older, had more practice, I've developed grounding techniques to keep me lucid and actively making choices within the dreams. Before I go to bed, I decide what I'd like to do that night and if I happen to have a lucid dream. After my father died, I'd often use that lucid dream space to see him and talk to him or just to give him a hug. I've always had complete control over my lucid dreams. It is until about a year ago. I had a lucid dream that has haunted me ever since. Here is the dream. I became lucid and decided I wanted to see my father. 
It felt as though a rope was attached to my chest and was pulling me through time and space fast. I passed through what looked like many walls until I landed on my feet in what looked like a waiting room. There was a gray-haired man sitting behind a desk. I looked at him, expecting to see my father, so I was very confused. I told him I was there to see my father. He looked toward a side door, and a moment later, a frizzy-haired man walked through. He had a very large nose and wore glasses. He asked me to come inside with him. I was extremely lucid, but very confused at this point because I had zero control over the dream. Felt as though somebody else was very much in control and it was out of my hands. So I walked to a corner of the room with him and he rested his hands on a metal bar that was attached to the wall and looked deep into my eyes. You will not see your father today, he said as I stared into his eyes. His form completely changed. He became a beautiful, dark-haired Indian man and tattoos that looked like runes or ancient symbols appeared on the back of his hands. You have to come here to be healed. He led me through the side door and into a room. He reclined on a cushion and pulled me into his arms. Can't explain how it felt except to say that I felt completely, purely loved. It was bliss. We stayed like that for a long time until he told me that this lucid dream would soon be coming to an end. He warned me that it would soon be over and that I would return to my bed. I clung to him and pulled myself tight to him and begged him to let me stay. Will I ever see you again? I asked. He looked deeply into my eyes and said that where he is and where I am are too far apart and that seeing each other again would be impossible. He began tearing apart into what looked like tiny pixels into the vision until the vision was completely gone. Everything was just a void and I awoke in my bed completely confused and even a little bit traumatized. I don't know what this lucid dream was, but I do know this. Number one, I had zero control of the dream as I normally do. Two, there was consciousness to the dream and it wasn't mine. Three, I feel that this man provided some kind of service to me, though I had no idea what it was. But a month later, I had another lucid dream. I chose to see my father. I saw him, but he looked at me differently as though a spiritual separation had occurred. He looked at me and shook his head back and forth as if to say no. I experienced a knowing that I'd not be able to visit him again. It's been a full year now and I have never had a lucid dream about my father since. Thank you so much for all you both do, Callie. Okay, so when people lucid dream, they typically can control where they go, what they do, who they see. That's a wonderful question, Jenny. And see, I just don't know because I'm not able to dream lucidly. Mm -hmm. I just dream what I dream and I have no idea that it's not real until I wake up. I always thought lucid dream kind of meant um, very, very vivid, but you are right. It is uh, something where the dreamer is uh, aware that they are dreaming. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I've had that my entire life in most dreams. Yeah. There's been some where I'm, I'm unaware, but I'd say a, a majority of the dreams I have, I'm aware of them, but I usually, I, I don't have any sort of I guess spiritual experience or a whole lot of control. Okay. Because lucid dream just means you're aware that you're in a dream. Mm -hmm. Now, if you are able to amp that control up even more, then I guess that more power to you. Mm -hmm. But I'm not able to decide, okay, uh, if I realize I'm dreaming, I want to see this person sure. or that I can't just call them up and they will be there. It seems, at least with me, I'm pretty much at, at the mercy of wherever that dream is going wherever I want to explore. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'll do weird things like I'll go, you know, because I know I'm dreaming. So sometimes I'll be able to fly or something. I'll go <laughs> jump off a large building and fly a little bit. Or if I land, on, I have done this before in my dreams Okay. with the full intent on in like the last one I had. I'm not saying this right now is the last one I had, but my thought process was, well, I, this one I had not that long ago. I was able to fly when I, I, I fell off of something. That was great. I'm going to go try that. I'll go up here and jump. And then uh, I, I went splat. Oh, no. And to the point where I then, the rest of the dream, uh, was dead. And all the way to the point of getting lowered into the ground in a coffin. Wow. I was, I, was, I think, probably like, I don't know, 14 or 15 when I had that one. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was kind of weird. I'm like, I'm running for this dream to be done. But I usually uh, know, I, I can usually get out of those dreams. 
mm-hmm. by closing my eyes and opening them in the dream. Okay. That's like my trick to get out of a dream that I know I'm dreaming if I don't want it to continue. Mm-hmm. Um, so there you go. Okay. But uh, as far as being able to control it, I don't know. Maybe that's something that you can practice and learn more about, but. That kind of scares me, that stuff. Yeah. I, I don't know. I mean, I, I've, it, it's hard for me to put a lot of weight on it being paranormal when someone is doing that, mm-hmm. you know, unless, unless it then somehow moves into reality as well. Like you get a message from someone in this, this very lucid dream that you know you're dreaming about, and then it actually turns out to be true and you had no prior knowledge other than from the dream. Mm-hmm. They're okay. Then you got a paranormal argument. Other than that, it's hard to say, now you're really reconnecting with your, your dad or you're really, re- or is this just what you, you're, you're, doing this to get the emotions of it and, and the feel-good aspect of it, which could be very therapeutic. I don't, you know, uh, knock anything for that. But can you, how do you verify that it, you really are making that interaction? Right. Yeah, that's the difficult part. Mm-hmm. But thank you for uh, for sharing that story with us. Uh, Laura P. writes in, hey guys, it's Laura. I have another story I'd like to share. It was around when I've been uh, living with my stepdad. We had this big tree in front of our house that we loved so much. We often climbed it and played around it, but after some years, my dad told us he had to cut the tree down. My brothers and stepsisters were upset, but I was the one crying not to cut it down and ran to my room. The next day, they were cutting it, and I was crying my eyes out. Later that night, like usual, getting scared in my room, I went to my little brother's room, trying to wake him up so I can sleep against the wall to feel safe, but failed. So I left the hallway light on and drifted off to sleep. Suddenly awoke from a noise in the room. When I looked, I saw three white figures, possibly male. One was at the edge of the bed, the other looking at the desk where my brother had his toys and one walking around the room. I got spooked and covered myself, still looking at them, not believing my eyes because I can see right through them and the hallway light still on. I was so scared I tried to wake up my brother, but then one of the figures looked straight at my face where I was peeking through. At the moment, I was still shaking. All I could think of was, they saw me, they saw me. I suddenly felt my feet getting touched and I instantly froze. I don't know how long this lasted, but I soon had the courage to take my blanket and then they were gone. I don't remember what happened after, if it fell asleep or not, but a couple of years. I was talking with my aunt and she was telling me that she had this favorite tree in at home in Mexico and they, as they were cutting it down, she was really upset and crying all night. She told me that she had woken up at night and saw children around her bed. Can't remember the rest of the story, but I was speechless because I had a similar situation. So I told her my story. To this day, I'm curious why the three men and children visit us as if they were connected to the trees. They were saying goodbye. Not sure, but I hope you guys have an answer to this. Thanks a lot. Keep up the good work, Laura. I was thinking maybe it was some kind of spirit that comes when, you know, little kids are really upset, like they just lost their tire swing tree or whatever. Mm-hmm. And so these things come and are trying to comfort. But I don't know. It's just kind of weird that the similarity between those two stories and mm-hmm. it was different things that came but they still came and they didn't do anything malicious i wonder if it's just something where it's a spirits of of people or something that have passed but have a connection to that property or that area also had a love of the tree and they were feeling a you know a kinship on the feeling of you know longing for that tree or sadness because of that tree and in their realm just more drawn to emotion than anything felt oh there's someone feeling the same thing who's alive Mm -hmm. and that kind of drew them that way Maybe so. I don't know. Either that, or maybe there were several people buried by the tree, and their remains nourished the tree quite a bit. But I was thinking with, you know, when people do get buried, there's actually a, a service that does this. A service that takes cremated remains, and they put it in, like, a urn with a tree. Okay. And if that is uh, planted... And then that actually, you know, kind of becomes part of the tree. Would that, could that make that tree haunted? I don't know. I'm guessing this is a relatively new service. Yeah, it is now. But I'm, I'm just saying in general for, I mean, that being something that currently exists. But, 
you know, I'm just thinking in older times where people would have been buried in their yard or something of that nature. <laughs> you know, w- could that could that tie in? I don't know. It's an interesting thought. 855-853-4802 is our phone number here at Real Ghost Stories Online to share your real ghost stories with us. Bonnie writes in, hi, Tony and Jenny. This is Bonnie from Illinois. I'm running to follow up on a story that I sent in about what I call praying mantis man and I saw that I saw while out for an early morning run. I very, very recently moved to South Carolina, but I lived in O'Fallon, Illinois for over 16 years. It's about 15 minutes east of St. Louis, Missouri. I'd like to share some information about this area since the events may be meaningful. First, on January 5th of 2000, there was a documented UFO sighting. The story was featured on the ABC special, Seeing is Believing with Peter Jennings, a Discovery Channel special, UFOs over Illinois, and an episode of the sci-fi series, Proof Positive. I'm not claiming that what I saw was alien, only that an alien incident may have occurred. Then, in approximately 2009, a water tower was being constructed along the same road where I saw a praying mantis man. A very deep hole was being dug to accommodate this structure. Each morning that I passed this area, I'd feel what is best described as an eerie vibe. I felt the strange energy coming from that hole. I just wanted to pass by as quickly as possible and not look in that direction in fear of what I might see. A strange sight crossed my path in about 2010. By now, my old dog Sparky had passed on and my new companion Cody was out with me for my run. The water towers were constructed in a cornfield. At the back of the field is a wooded area and along each side of the tower are several houses that our yards back up to with the field. It was from this cornfield between the tower and the houses that I saw a concentrated white ball of fog rolling out of the field and across the road. It wasn't unusual for the fog to settle in the fields at night and it often streamed out from the fields. However, at this time there was no fog accumulated in or following from the field. It was a complete ball, and from this ball, long tendrils would form, reaching forward as if consciously and intentionally moving from one side of the road to the other. My dog became very alert and focused on this formation. I was not frightened, but intrigued. I was running toward it, and it made, it, it made its way across the road and into a grassy area that was somewhat lit by a street light. In less than 20 seconds, I was in the spot it had been in moments ago, and it had literally vanished. There was no fog in that area at all. I don't know if it was paranormal. It definitely seemed unnatural. I wonder if these occurrences may fall under the theory of the existence of portals. They're not the end of my strange experiences. I have more tales to tell, but I am most excited to tell you about a poltergeist that shared my family's home in Muckitio, Washington from the fall of 1977 till the summer of 1980. Thanks for all the wonderful stories and keep them coming. Do you think there's certain areas where they have a heightened level of paranormal activity or, you know, including UFO activity that maybe just are easier for ghosts to manifest and show up? Like just those places around the world where just a lot of weird stuff happens yeah i do i mean do you think it has something to do with like for lack of a better term the landscape or like what the ground is like if an area is heavy in limestone Mm -hmm. or or mineral deposits of some sort whatever you know metallic material do you think it has anything to do with that i'm wondering something you know a natural aspect of it Mm -hmm. i don't know what but i know that it seems like weird things seem to be grouped together. Mm-hmm. I agree. When you have one, a lot of times you have the other mm-hmm. in specific areas. I mean, obviously, like when you talk about, you know, some areas like in the desert, like in Nevada and stuff, you have a lot of UFO stuff mm-hmm. that people are talking about. And that makes me wonder, in that area, is it just more visible just because of the vast mm-hmm. landscape and the openness that you are are more prone to to see something that you otherwise would write off as, oh, it's an airplane or this or that. Mm-hmm. Um you know, with, uh, and then when you have that too, you know, is the environment conducive to just being able to focus on more things that are out of the ordinary? You know? I don't know. I, I think that, yeah, I think you're on to, I, I think there is something to that. I mean, we talk a lot about homes and stuff, you know, the old limestone house mm-hmm. or things of that nature. So I suppose if the environment is built up of that as well, wouldn't it be the same thing? 
Maybe. I think so. I don't know. Heather writes in, Hi, Brewskies. I've been listening to your podcast for a few months and I'm really enjoying it. I thought I'd share my story for my teen years. My stepsister and I were curious about the Ouija board, as most teens are. We decided to buy one and use it. We got home and set it up, placed our hands on the planchette and asked some teen girl related questions about boys and such. We were giggling when it started to move. Accusing each other of moving it, we quickly realized it was moving on its own and neither of us was messing around with it. Started answering the questions we asked it and gave us specific dates of when these things would transpire. Since it was weeks into the future, we were both like, oh yeah, sure, whatever. Like that, we actually, uh, like that will actually happen. Nothing weird happened directly after that first night of playing with the board. A few weeks passed and on one of the days, the board mentioned the event we were told about actually happened. I was weirded out and went home and told my stepsister. So that night, feeling a little uneasy, I decided to not use it anymore. I ran upstairs to my room to retrieve the board and decided to put it under our porch until we could get rid of it. I didn't want to sleep in my room that night since it felt a little strange in there. I couldn't figure out why at the time, so I slept on the living room floor. The porch and front door is off the living room. That night I had a nightmare, however, I knew I was dreaming. In the dream, I was sitting upright on the living room floor and someone was out on the porch, pounding on the front door while saying, Heather, let me in. I woke up, free I woke up freaked out because it felt real. I was completely awake in the dream. I had the same nightmare for a week. My father eventually took it away from the house and burned it, and that night, the dream stopped. One can say it was just fear to cause my nightmares, but it was still strange. Unrelated to this event, I'm prone to sleep paralysis, and I guess lucid dreams. I've had several sleep paralysis experience, and some are really terrifying. That's my story. It's a bit long. Sorry. Love the show. Actually, stop listening to another one because yours was so much better. Trying out the whole EPP thing as well. Thanks for reading. She was lucky that after they burned the board that it stopped because most of the time that just releases whatever is attached to the board. It makes you wonder then if it did release and go and bother someone else mm -hmm. around her if they have stories that she's unaware of. Mm -hmm. That's a creepy story. Thanks for sharing. 855-853-4802 is our number here at Real Ghost Stories Online to share your experiences. Of course, if you're not an EPP yet, sign up on the website, realghoststoriesonline.com. Just click Become an EPP. Charles says there's a place in Cannon City, Colorado, where I stayed. My older sister and she lived in this apartment building. This old building is over 140-some years old. This building was originally a hospital, but it burned down and was restored. They converted it into a mental hospital, and it was getting funded, so it went out of operation. A couple years later, it turned into a boy's home, and scarlet fever had hit. Most of the children had passed. The city had put the building up for sale. The person who bought it had restored it and made it into an apartment complex. When I stayed there, weird things and weird sounds filled the place with screams and footsteps. It's not their story. I'm here to tell you because they never bothered anyone. There was an old man by the name of Art. He was a friend of my brother-in-law's. One Friday morning, he came over, but our door was locked, so we knocked and knocked. Yes, my brother-in-law had ticked him off. He walked away, and 30 minutes later, did the knocking routine. We still didn't answer the door. About an hour later, we were all up and getting ready to leave. And as we did, we walked out to our door and noticed Art had extinguished a cigarette and the white door jam. We got back to my my sister had cleaned it up. We didn't see or hear from Art again until one morning the police came over for a wellness checkup. Ten minutes later, paramedics had arrived carrying Art out in a gurney. Later that day, we discovered that Art had hung himself in his living room. A couple weeks later, I was lying on the couch and someone started knocking on the door. Got up to answer it. I opened the door and no one was there, but I could smell the smell of Art. He smelled of Barbasol shaving cream and some kind of musty aftershave. I lay down. The same thing happened. Someone knocked and answered and no one was there. I th thought someone was playing a game. I stood behind the door and waited, peeping out the peephole. I waited for about 30 minutes watching and someone knocked, but no one was there. I opened the door quickly and smelled the old Barbasol smell. I looked up and down the hallway and there was nobody. 
I started to walk back into the apartment. And as you walk into our place on the right side of the door jam, I noticed no one but two fresh cigarette stains from cigarettes being extinguished. I asked my sister if she'd cleaned the door jam. I remember her cleaning it. And she said, yeah, I cleaned it. Then she asked me if it was okay. I told her that there are two marks on the door jam and that the hallway smells like Barbasol. She gave me a look and had to look for herself. She saw the marks. But when I had taken a look, there was three marked instead of two. A couple months later, we packed and moved out. So the neighbor just won't go away. It smell either. Mm-mm. Lisa's like the smell of Barbersaw and not like... <laughs> Death. Yeah. Uh, that, that could be the more disturbing of the two. I want to know what the, what the issue was. What do you mean? Between the, 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 the neighbor and why he was sitting there knocking that day. Mm. and Because he said the, that his brother had pissed him off or something of mm-hmm. that nature, a brother-in-law. Mm-hmm. Like, what was the reason? You know, is there a reason he's lingering? Is there some sort of unfinished business? Yeah. That's the, the weird part of that story. It, or maybe he just loved the house. I mean, it could be absolutely nothing to do with that mm-hmm. incident. But it's just, it's weird because it's all in that same timeline there. 855 855- 853-4802 is our number. Kevin says, I and my siblings moved to the city and our house in province somehow gained new occupants. One weekend, I decided to come home to check the house and I planned on staying for a couple of days knowing that my aunt and cousins will accompany me during my visit. I wasn't worried given the fact I'm hypersensitive and I sense and sometimes see creepy things. The first night, we decided to sleep in one room. I don't know why, but we had a gut feeling it's a good idea. I placed a mattress on the floor and immediately fell asleep. I guess because of the four-hour travel. Then the unimaginable happened. I experienced sleep paralysis. I was coherent, but my body was still asleep, and I couldn't move or talk. I was convinced that it was just the, the usual episode of sleep paralysis I randomly get, but I was dead wrong. I tried waking up, but it was useless. All of a sudden, I heard and felt footsteps around my bed. At first, the step seemed like it was checking out something. It freaked me out, and I tried everything to wake myself up, but it only triggered the footsteps, which made me realize that whoever or whatever was walking around me was indeed checking up on me. The more I struggled to wake up, the faster, heavier, and louder the footsteps became. The worst part was I felt it running toward my bed. Believe it or not, I felt the footsteps on the ground because the mattress is not that thick to block any impact on the floor if as if it doesn't want me to wake up I felt those feet pierce through my face and chest I felt the impact of those steps on the floor each and every step it wasn't cold just like how movies tell you that there's a presence in fact it was warm warm as a person's breath I broke out of the sleep paralysis and screamed as loud as I could which I wanted to alert the people in the room I was so freaked out that I almost cried after that. This is coming from a grown man. It makes you wonder when people leave a home and it sits empty. Mm -hmm. If things come in in the meantime and just hang out. I could see that being a possibility. I I think a lot of times we assume that that the ghosts want us to be around. Mm -hmm. That that they're seeking to have a message scent or something i wonder if sometimes they would rather just go to a familiar setting and not have to be bothered yeah by people or run the risk of being seen unintentionally and then freaking people out and feeling guilty i mean i could imagine you could still feel guilty if you're a ghost Mm -hmm. you know and if you're you're inadvertently freaking people out and you're just trying to have your own form of existence maybe at some point you're like okay i just like to go someplace where people aren't but i can still feel comfortable Sure. I could see that that being very much the case. It then really starts to make you wonder about, you know, abandoned homes Mm -hmm. and things of that nature. And how often, you know, people have stories and they naturally do look spooky. But, you know, is there more to that? Is there more to it, you know, when people say there's a weird energy here with this or that? You know, is, is there really something there? Is that more of an attractive area than just your average home? Well, with abandoned homes, you've got to wonder because is it haunted because it's abandoned Mm -hmm. or is it abandoned because it's haunted? (laughs) Yeah, like chicken before the egg? Yeah. Yeah. 
like did the people flee and leave it or is it now haunted because they you know they just left it to sit and it wasn't haunted when they left sure I've always wondered that I've always wondered about especially like on uh, some long drives that will take there's just a lot of homes like out of the country old country homes Mm -hmm. how does that happen eventually where a home just kind of becomes abandoned is it like well the owners passed away and then it there was no one to give the property to the bank ended up taking it after you know i'm sure that each and every one have their own story but some of my i'm just i sit and i wonder because it's like that must have been a really beautiful home at some time mm-hmm. at one time how did it get this way because even even a lot of times it when a bank takes it they still try and keep it up to a level at which they can sell it at some point you know, at some point, maybe or maybe it's just sitting in the family. Sure. And the, the family just doesn't want to take care of it or they're far away. And it's just, well, it's property. Right. And it just sits there. I don't know. It's, it's I don't know. It's always so intriguing to me mm-hmm. as to, like, what's the story behind some of those homes? Olivia writes in, hi, Brewskies. My name is Olivia. I'm from a tiny town in northwest Georgia. I have several stories to tell and have them written down to be sure I don't miss any. This one happened around Christmas of 2014. My family and I were staying in a hotel in downtown Chattanooga, Tennessee for a Christmas party happening down the street. My younger sister and I had never stayed there before. However, my parents have many times. As soon as we walked in, I had a strange feeling come over me. I wouldn't say I have any sort of gifts. I feel like too many people who really don't say they do. But I felt something watching me as we walked in and felt it following me through our stay. At this point, I had no knowledge of the hotel's past. I waited in a hallway that had pictures dating back to the 1800s while my mom checked in. Now keep in mind this way, a very old hotel that you could tell as soon as you walked in from the smell in the air to the detail in the woodwork, it just isn't seen in new hotels. I went up to our room on the fourth floor and as soon as we got settled, I looked up the hotel online with the world haunted uh, and uh, not to my uh, word word haunted, haunted. the word haunted. I looked up the word haunted And not to my surprise, several things came up. One in particular that stood out to me, and I just couldn't shake it off, was uh, the tale of Annalisa Netherly. It said that uh, in room 311, Annalisa was decapitated, nearly decapitated, from having her throat cut while in the bath by a jealous lover or her husband. Another tale is that her lover left her, so she decided, or she died of a broken heart or committed suicide. Fun fact, Al Capone stayed in the room while awaiting trial. I can remember looking out our window into what I thought was just a regular alleyway, which was enclosed by the rest of the hotel. The night my sister and I went down to the pool. We came back, went straight to sleep. However, throughout the night, I kept waking up during what sounded like and hearing people yelling in the alleyway or arguing very loudly. I thought at the time that it was just a regular alleyway and there's probably some late drinkers out there saying that it was a Friday night. The next morning we were packing up our stuff to leave whenever I looked back out the window to see what it's all out there. But I found this for more creepy. It was far more creepier than I could have imagined. We were on the fourth floor. I looked out straight across and I saw the window across the alley from us. And I saw the one below it, which I noticed was on the very bottom of the alley, which meant that the alley was actually the roof of the second floor. I counted out and I realized that the room just across the alley from us the one down was room 311. My sister and I sat there for a while watching it. We witnessed the curtains move and we kind of had a panic moment, but then we realized it was just the cleaning lady pulling back the curtains and we could see through the sheer white curtain. The cleaning lady turned off the lamp, pulled her cart out and walked out. We saw her walk out with the door shutting behind her. We stared at the window for a little while longer and next thing we know, the curtain started to move, which was very strange seeing that We were watching everyone else in there walk out. Not long after that, we watched a light that started out small and white and got bigger until it turned slightly orange and moved across between the window and the curtain and then behind the curtain to the room. Grew into a big, bright red ball that was in the room moving around. We couldn't believe what we just saw. We went and told our parents. They told us we're crazy and we need to just stop looking things up on the internet. We begged them to believe us, but no one would until a bellhop came to our room to get our luggage. Our parents asked him to please tell us that we're just being crazy and silly and there's nothing there. He says, oh, you mean Annalisa? Everyone knows she's there. She hasn't hurt anybody. 
She just lets everyone know that she's there. They sat there in shock. They left a few minutes later and haven't been back since. I remember not being scared but mesmerized by the fact that she was communicating with me. I haven't been able to shake the thought of Annalisa. I feel sympathy for her and I believe she picked up on that to the point she knew I wouldn't be scared of her. There are several more ghosts at the hotel that I didn't make any contact with and don't particularly hope to. Anyways, thank you both for so much. Thanks so much for what you do. Keep up the great work. Best wishes, Olivia. I kind of wondered if maybe Annalisa showed up as an orb so she wouldn't scare the little girls. Mm-hmm. You know, I think it'd be more frightening to see a full-bodied apparition than just a orb. Yeah, just she's she's making wise choices about how she's going to make her presence known. Mm -hmm. There's a desire to do it, but maybe she's has the ability to to choose how she shows up. Yeah, I wonder if that's something like a skill you develop as a ghost. I don't know. Like over time, it's like, oh, I I can only show myself this way. Wait a second, if I condense energy here or something, I can show up this way or that way. You know, because mm -hmm. we it's interesting where you have stories of what were once people that are ghosts and sometimes it's always the same thing and then sometimes it's different things and sometimes it can be even somewhat scary things but still all the evidence points to it not being something really demonic of being more so a person yeah if that's like a, a, a skill to develop as as a ghost odd 855-853-4802 is our number dano calls in hi hey tony this is dano again calling for the third time I don't know if you guys have uh, shared any of my, uh, I, I guess, all the problems that we're having, but I just kind of wanted to let you guys know what else is going on here in my life. Um, about, I think it was Saturday, Saturday night, uh, me and my fiance, and at this time now we have all the kids sleeping with us in the room because they just can't sleep in the other rooms because they keep saying they sing they keep saying they see a little girl with black hair and she has like a polka dot dress so we don't really understand what that is but we know now the kids are sleeping in the room with us so Saturday night what happened is we're sleeping and all of a sudden I hear the door open thinking maybe one of the kids is going to the bathroom. So I, I look over and all the kids are sleeping. You know, I, I look I look at the door and it's cracked open and I can see something staring at me. And it and it just terrified me completely. And I don't know what to make of it, but it stood there, and then all of a sudden, the door closed slowly, and nothing. It was gone. And it's just very confusing and scary because, you know, I don't know what to do. I've seen a lot of movies with ghosts and stuff like that, and I know, like, if you keep taunting it or something, something's going to happen. That's why I make these calls outside of the house when I'm not there. Uh, I'm, I'm actually going to email you guys on Facebook. Hopefully you, uh, I get an email back, you know, so we can hopefully chat about the situation. Um, it'd be great to hear from other people of, you know, understanding of, you know, what I may be dealing with. You know, right now we just, we just don't have the money to leave and this is the only place in town for rent and you know we're just trying to figure it out and you know it's rent to buy it so we're renting to buy it and it's just trying to figure this out so uh thanks for listening uh uh it'd be great to uh get some feedback thanks tony now did somebody start a message board for him because this is this is his third call I don't believe so. Okay. I don't believe so, but it wouldn't be a bad thought. Because your advice was for them to leave. Mm hmm And now we know that they can't Not an option. do that. Yeah. Yeah. With something, you know, like that, 
I mean, obviously that would be the, the, the best choice of action, but beyond that not being really an option, what would, you know, what, what sort of advice would you have for that? First thing I do is I would demand it to leave mm-hmm. and see if that helps at all. Mm-hmm. And if it doesn't, then I, you know, would go further and maybe get, you know, somebody in there to see if it is demonic or not. Yeah. I just be careful with the individuals that you, you would hire if you do hire someone or to look into it and, and maybe do some research on it and see, you know, if, if you have some folks, you know, probably start with like, I would say maybe like a local paranormal society and, and very much stress. You don't want an investigation done. You already know something's going on. Mm-hmm. You know, it's a matter of what can we do to get rid of this and maybe they can then make some recommendations as as to who to contact for that, whether it be some sort of, you know, spiritual ritual or, or something of that nature, you know, where, you know, you do the saging, you do some sort of, you know, blessing of some sort, and maybe that would help. Um, but just don't don't jump on the the thing that we hear all too often of the Let's do an investigation because there's all too many people who are who are ready to do an investigation, and unfortunately, we have there's there's a lot of people out there who who don't really know what they're doing with it, and yeah. can sometimes stir it up and make it much worse than it actually is. That was actually in in our EPP episode a couple of weeks back, where there was that that sort of thing that happened. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, just be careful on your wording and who you talk to and what uh, you know what individual you bring in there to to try and get some help with and i do hope that you're able to to get uh get that dealt with so it doesn't keep bothering you and your family 855-853-4802 is our number troy in ohio hi hey this is uh troy from columbus ohio i'd like to tell a little story um so me and my my ex-fiance we uh decided to get our own place and we got this apartment her her dad used to run i don't know if he still does anymore but and it's an old place. It's kind of in a rough neighborhood. I wanted to do some history on the place where I'm living because I'm a paranormal, supernatural geek. So, but I couldn't find anything on it. So one day, it's about three months living in the place. Um, I always, when I bring the groceries in, I take we had a cat, and I put the cat in the guest bedroom uh, while we bring good groceries through in the door. And I, some time had passed. I forgot the cat was in the in the bedroom, <laughs> we had already unloaded the groceries. I was like, oh crap, I gotta go get the cat. So I go up, open the door, and I don't see the cat anywhere. Well, behind the door, when I opened it, the cage was there. I couldn't open the door all the way. In the cage was the cat locked in the cage. And it's not one of those cages where you can lock it, you have to take two hands to open it up and lock it. So I thought that was kind of weird. So I let him out. And some time went by, and a couple days later, I'm downstairs, watch TV, she's at work, and I hear footsteps upstairs. I'm like, I'm looking, the cat's right next to me, so I know it's not the cat. So I go upstairs, so just two bedrooms upstairs in the bathroom. Nobody's up there, nothing, I could make any noise. So she comes home later that night, and I'm like, all right, there's some stuff going on in the house. So I'm like, all right, I got a digital voice recorder. We're going to sit, sit here, light some candles, I turn all the lights off. We uh, sat there for about an hour, I started asking questions. You know, what, who are you? What's your name? Blah, blah, blah. Standard stuff. And she spooked out of her mind. And it's a pretty eerie place, mm. especially with the lights off and the candles on. So we're pretty, both of us pretty spooked out. So I let it, I just let the digital recorder run all night, see what I can catch the next day. So the next day I take it to work and I'm listening to it at work in my headphones and nothing, just nothing, just all quiet. Until about the end of the recording, all you can hear, I had to replay it like six times. All you can hear is a faint voice. So I take it, I plug it through the computer and I enhance it. And it's a little girl's voice. And I went to my neighbors, I, was, I said, do you guys have kids? They looked around, have you guys got little girls? I said, no. No, we don't have kids. No, we don't have kids. No. Nope. I thought that was weird. So I did it again. Yes, next night. <clears throat> it was the same exact thing. At the end of the recording, you hear the girl's voice. I'm like, what in the hell? 
So I did do some research on it, and it seems there was a woman that died in the house, but and she didn't have kids either, which is really weird. She died in natural thought. But I just thought that was pretty spooky. So what do you think? I think it's pretty amazing that something was able to get the cat into the cage. Because most of the time the cats are the first one to bolt. Uh huh. So kudos to that ghost. Do you think it wanted it in the cage so it wouldn't escape and wouldn't like be sitting there scratching at the door trying to get out and Or maybe it just doesn't like cats. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. It's uh it's an interesting thing uh, for the uh, the ghost to take that sort of an action with the pet. Mm-hmm. I suppose it's better than many other things that could have happened, but uh, that is rather entertaining. Yeah. And it's kind of cool that he was able to, to kind of narrow down exactly, uh, or at least get the direction of, of who or what this might be mm -hmm. from, from those findings. So cool story. Thank you for calling in and sharing that experience with us. All right. That wraps up today's episode of Real Ghost Stories Online. If you have a real ghost story you'd like to share with us, give us a call. Or, of course, you can also write it on the website. RealGhostStoriesOnline.com. If you like the show, please help us stay on the air. Become an EPP. Get all of our bonus episodes at GhostPodcast.com. GhostPodcast.com. Check that out. Until next time, for Jenny Bruski, I'm Tony Bruski. Thanks for listening to another episode of Real Ghost Stories Online.